Uh, Dr. Doreen and Shannon, what advice could you offer to me that may be helpful to share with my new paraprofessionals I'm getting, uh, as well as the art, music, and, and such teachers in regards to my two nonverbal, in need of toilet training kindergarten boys that I will be getting? Specifically, what general guidelines could you suggest to support attending the elective classes, and what behaviors should be tolerated? Or how, or how long to allow disruptive behaviors before leaving the class. I don't want to teach them that if they misbehave, they can leave their class. And she said, thank you so much um, for everything. I think, man, these are some of the best questions about inclusion that I've heard from a teaching professional because it shows me that you want them in the classroom, mm -hmm. but you recognize what the difficulties will be Absolutely. for some students. Right. And this is the reality of inclusion is how do you deal with these kinds of moments? So right. help us. And you know, the, the and you, it is very obvious also that this teacher recognizes that letting the children out of the classroom is a reward. And so yeah. one of the things that I often present in my presentations is that our kids are pretty intelligent and they may not be able to communicate, but they, are, they, they communicate non-verbally and they understand things like, you know, if I tantrum and scream, what ends up happening each time I do that is that they take me for a walk in the back in the on the playground or they send me home and you know I'll have to be very honest I don't know any kids uh, who wouldn't like prefer that so oh, yeah. it's a very smart thing to do is to scream tantrum or misbehave in order to be sent home and they might not even uh, you know I guess actively know that they're doing this but it is a no doubt it's a, a behavior that when, they, when a child misbehaves, there's no question that that behavior will increase if you actually let them out of the situation. So this is a very good question. There's a few suggestions I have um, <clears throat> because you ask something very important, which is how much should be tolerated. And in general, I try to tell people, you know, you, if you want a child to um, become as typical, typical or normal or fit in with the typical other kids, as, as much as you want that, then it's important to treat the child the same way. So sometimes what I'll say, and it's not really 100% accurate, so I'll detail it a little bit more here, but sometimes what I'll say is don't treat your child, this child, any different than any other child, mm -hmm. just because they have a disability. Um, and you know that will hold true in this case. I, you sh really what I'm saying is don't tolerate bad behavior in any case, no matter what the child's disability, because the rule holds that if you tolerate bad behavior, it will continue. Yeah. If you allow bad behavior, it will increase. I mean, you just can't do that. So, so the key is not how to deal with it after it occurs, but more what can we do to prevent stuff that will be detrimental to the classroom. So to begin with, the first thing I think that would be very important for this group of uh, paras, paraprofessionals and other teachers, is if they could just familiarize themselves a little bit more with the basic uh, concepts of autism and ABA, just the very basic stuff like, you know, why does a child with autism, and you can certainly find on our YouTube archives, as you mentioned, probably a lot of stuff where I talk about just the characteristics of autism. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be important for people to recognize, like really try to understand what a child with autism is, how, what sets them off, what aggravates them, what makes them frustrated, what are the things that often result in bad behavior, you know, what we call bad behavior which really is their communication. I think that's the key to helping people understand autism is that children with autism don't behave bad because of their disorder. They just behave in challenging ways because they can't communicate it in any other way. And there's hundreds of examples of this that I've given over the course of this show and many lectures. You know, a child who can't say, um, can I have that toy? who can't express, can't understand if you say, sure, you'll have it in five minutes, it's not your turn. Mm -hmm. What is that child gonna do? They're gonna just try to hit and grab the toy. And usually when you do that, you get the toy because there's no adult to intervene and you end up becoming more of a bully, but you end up getting the toy and that's rewarded. Yeah. Um, you know, if a child is irritated because the lights or sounds in the classroom are too much and too overwhelming, 
He's going to throw a tantrum when he's in there, and typically he'll be removed, and he'll learn this was a pretty effective way of letting them know I'm disturbed in this environment. So it's really important to try to, for all of the parents and the teachers, to try to understand the kids. It's not it's more important that you really understand how a child with autism is functioning um, and why they do the things they do. That's more important than knowing how to deal with it. Because if you can identify why they are doing certain things, then, general, then the general rule of ABA will apply to every circumstance. And the general rule of ABA is reward good behavior and don't reward bad behavior. That rule will apply, but you have to understand why someone's doing something. So in most cases, a child will behave badly. It's some form of communication. Again, as a summary, what are they trying to communicate? Are they trying to get out of a situation, get access to a situation, gain your attention, or is it something that no one can figure out? What is the function? That's basically the thing that they have to identify. That would be the most important thing, and that would really only take an hour of time. Maybe you can bring them together as a group, mm -hmm. have them watch a few of our videos or have them get on the IBT site, which yeah. you mentioned, yeah. and actually do an hour or two of training. That's a, a big gift you could give them. I think I also have online, not just through us, but other places where I've spoken, like, like the previous Dan conferences and mm -hmm. um, lots of autism conferences. There's a lot of my presentations and lectures, which kind of are two hour or some are even four hour, but they summarize all of this stuff, you know, yeah. pretty in a detailed fashion. So I think if they understand the children, they'll know a little bit more. If they understand the very basic principles of ABA, they'll know much more in terms of how to handle the children. Um, I would suggest that you, I feel it's always a balance, Shannon, of pushing, but not too hard. So you want to push the child so that they are actually stretching their limits a little bit, but you don't want to push them so hard that they lose it and become, you know, completely disturbed by whatever and act out. Right. It's the same principle applies to any child. It's the same with our kids. Yeah. You always just want to, especially because these kids are nonverbal, you really want to remember that we communicate in other ways when we are nonverbal, and we tend to communicate in sort of you know aggressive challenging ways because we don't have a, f a way to communicate in any better format the faster they learn some form of augmentative communication the less they'll have challenging behaviors now that could be just any kind of basic token you know just touching a pet icon iconic system and they can have reinforcers that are tokens or reinforcers that are actual real tangibles but just some form of communication. Uh, some children who are nonverbal often are able to type and they can communicate through, uh, like for instance, the iPad programs like Proloquo and other programs where you can touch an icon is great. Just producing a pec sport is great. Anything that allows the child to communicate their needs, that would be the first thing, what they need and want. I wanna go out, I wanna break, I want this food, I wanna juice, I don't wanna work with, I want the, with that person, whatever it is. Yeah. That will significantly help reduce behaviors. Um, you mentioned they're not toilet trained. You know, you can keep them on a schedule. And I think that through an intensive like toilet training program, of course, the family can help with the toilet training. I think you, they mentioned the age. The kids were like five or six. I, I believe that imagine. these are the kindergartners. Yeah, so maybe that's why I have five or six in my mind. Kindergarten boys. Yeah, so both of them can easily be toilet trained. I mean, I don't know if we have a toilet training video on YouTube from this show, but yes, we have we do. several. Okay, great. By several so, different doctors. Yeah, so please, you. please do review that because that will help and maybe train the parents on that. But I feel like, you know, when we say it takes a village, especially with our kids, it takes really uh, kind of a collaborative effort between the family and the teachers and the parents, of course, to come together and do this. And they can have a very successful time with you. And I just wanna say as a former classroom teacher that, you know, sometimes, I know your question was, what do we do about when the behavior is already happening and that, and that the answer was about, let's catch the behavior before it happens. But I want to, I want to tell you that that's so effective. Yes, that is. a couple of those changes, and you honestly won't be dealing with the other part of the question. And that Absolutely. is why that is why Dr. Grandpache answered it the way she did. That when you give a child the empowerment of I have an ability to communicate and I have a voice 
whatever that voice is in this class to talk about what's going on. And when the classroom environment is rewarding, they aren't looking for the way to get out. It's true. They're looking for the way to communicate, but when you don't have it, yes. the frustration is amazing. And you know, thank you for coming back to that because realistically, I should give some pointers also in terms of if things go wrong. <laughs> you know, like, so let's talk about that too because, so here's, here's the way that you should handle this whole thing. We're gonna try our very, very best to not let things go wrong, right? And so, um, let's just list some of the things that you would do. One thing is you'd want to make the environment of the classroom uh, calming and rewarding to begin with. So some antecedent control has to do with just the environment. And you, so that means that you should probably talk with the parents and figure out what, you know, do these children, uh, how they do with lights, how do they do with sounds, uh, you know, all that sort of stuff. I would uh, make sure they're comfortable where they are and what location of the classroom and then I would make sure they're not uh, disturbed by what's going on around them. Now, secondly, I would want to make sure that you start with a really, really low baseline of expectation. So uh, perhaps the way to go about it, and you'd get a better feel for this if you were had the opportunity to observe the children or perhaps the parents would be able to observe and tell you in their regular home and to see or in, a, in their prior to coming to your classroom or just to figure out kind of what are these child's strengths and weaknesses. But what I would do is I would start with just 15 minute incre increments where the child every 15 minutes is, despite regardless of the behavior that's going on every 15 minutes, gets to go for a walk for five minutes. Yeah. Because I would really reduce the, pr the demand of staying in the classroom for I don't know how many hours. It's kindergarten, right. so it could potentially be 30 hours a week. So, you really want to start with frequent breaks, naturally given on a non-contingent basis, and frequent reinforcers. So every five minutes, go up to the child and give them a free reward and just say, good job, you're doing great, and that's it, right? And you, by doing that, you will more likely prevent anything bad from happening because you're loading the child up with reinforcers and you're really minimizing demand. So in the beginning, your reinforcer level is huge and your demand level is very, very low. So do not ask the child to participate in too many things unless you see that the child is engaged and interested. Mm -hmm. If you ask the child to participate, make sure there's full prompting and modeling. So there's a one-to-one the -one there pair of with the child actually helping the child as much as possible don't expect new learning to occur in the first days what you gradually do over the course of time is you reverse that cycle you increase the demand and you gradually reduce the reinforcer now that's a successful thing with pretty much anything you ever want to teach anyone right you just right. increase the demand very gradually and then you decrease the reinforcer so that it's more like real life, the real classroom contingencies. But in the beginning, just make it a fabulous experience for the child. Yeah, That's absolutely. the best way to go. It is, uh, and, and you'll see, you'll have amazing results. I, I know we're gonna be in contact with you and I, I look forward to you writing us back and let us, letting us know how it goes. Right. DJ uh, Phillips is joining us. He has been a fan of the show for a long period of time. Uh, I've often said we should have put DJ to work because he works for us in a, in a way. Absolutely. He, he calls us, he keeps us on our toes. Uh, he's been working really hard on a PowerPoint presentation about autism and watching every single thing that he can that Dr. Grandpuchet says. And he asked if he could come on the show to ask a question. So DJ, welcome to Autism Live. We're thrilled to have you on the show for the first time. Thank you, Sarah. I, I appreciate it. Well, we're, we're thrilled that you're here, and I know we had an opportunity to introduce you to Dr. Grampuche uh, during the break, uh, and that that was thrilling for all of us. I know you had some things that you wanted to say to her right at the start of the show here. Well, Dr. Doreen, it is a pleasure to finally get to uh, meet you, but uh, before we get too far in, I want to take it that that's not really Dr. Doreen Grampuche has been working in the field of autism for 36 years. She started under the direction of Dr. Ivar Lovans, and then in 1990, she opened the Center for Autism, what we now know as CARD. After this, she created a web-based program called Skills for Autism, and then after that, she created IDT and 
lastly, she did finish a book called The Evidence Based Treatment for Children with Autism, The Current Model, which you can get there on Amazon. And I read the book cover to cover. It is the best book on autism I have ever read. And lastly, this this year she was awarded the Professional of the Year Award by the Northwest Autism Foundation. Hopefully I can add something to that because at this time I would like to present Dr. Jolene with the Autism Hero and Visionary Award. Again, Dr. Doreen is a is a Dr. Doreen is a PhD DCBAB. So at this time, Shannon, if you could please present Dr. Doreen Bridge oh. is a PhD DCBAB with the Autism Hero and Visionary Award. And there we go. CJ, that is so touching. You have no idea. You changed my uh, day and week and month and probably year with that, <laughs> I have to tell you. First of all, so nice for me to be able to see you finally on camera. Sarah has told me a lot about you, as has Shannon. And I really appreciate You have no idea how meaningful it is to me that you have read the book, that you are following all the work that we do here and that you like it and that you find it useful and, and that you are saying all these things. I, I just love that and thank you so much. It means a, a ton to me, you have no idea. And um, this makes me very proud. This will go in my office. I'll send you a picture of this in my office um, and I will share it with all of my colleagues. Thank you so much, CJ. And DJ, mm -hmm. we... DJ. DJ, yes. And DJ. I have a CJ here. Who's That's cool. true. Uh, and I know that you have some questions. Yes, DJ, um, go That ahead. you have sent in. So you want to go ahead and start with your first question? I know a 24-year-old blind male who has CP and autistic tendencies. He, and he nods. He nods. When he not when asked if he needs a, a, a drink, he grunts when angry and he says one word when he needs to use the bathroom. How can we make his communication better? Right. That's... And again, and again, his father should be watching him. That's fantastic. And that's a fantastic question, DJ, too. There's a lot of, you know, uh, people who are like this, obviously. Um, whether they're two years old or 24 years old, it's always going to be the same answer. Um, often we will drop down to what we're capable of when we're responding or what's the easiest way of getting our intention across. So uh, often what we do at CARD is, for instance, if I want to increase, there's many things that you could do. If I want to increase someone's response from one word to multiple words, then I can either prompt them visually. For instance, I can write out the response so they can begin reading it, like I want drink, or I will hold up fingers so that they know that I need a three-word response, mm -hmm. I want drink. Or I can pretend not to understand until the person actually says. So I'll be like, and hold up the drink, and then I can prompt and say, I want drink. So you're going to be, there, there's going to be a lot of prompting going on at this phase to increase the length of the utterances. Um, it's important to know that if you, if people accept the one word utterances, then the individual has no real motivation to increase the utterance. So they have to, of course, you want to reward when someone uh, expresses something, even if it's one word, but you always want to try to increase it as well, and those are just some ways. Withholding the reinforcer for a little bit of time, and then modeling and prompting the longer uh, response. Okay. Um, what, if you do, what if you do it, he is totally blind, he cannot see it all, what do you do? In that case, which is why they're having trouble because they were going to get him 
an iPad because I had told them about the studies about if you pair iPads with functional communication, it actually increases communication according to studies. The thing is, you can't use an iPad because you totally won't. Exactly. And that's actually, you know, you made me think of something which, you know, they really should produce some Braille type programs for iPads, perhaps a Braille board that could be put on top of the screen. Yeah. But in the meantime, DJ, one idea would be if you, for instance, if you say, if you're trying to teach I want drink, which is three words, I would prompt the whole thing, I would verbally say it, so you want the individual to model, so you would say I, and have him say I, want, want, drink, drink. And at the same time, I would perhaps do three fingers, one at a time, in the palm of his hand so he can feel it. So I want drink, so that he can feel the three fingers. A lot of times people who are blind actually have an amazing use of their fingers and can actually count that. The connection between the two would allow you then to gradually reduce the verbal modeling and just be able to drop down to doing this, pointing, touching the fingers. And that would be a prompt that you could then fade to this, hitting all three together, and then you could actually fade the prompt, and the individual would get the idea that now we're requiring three versus one. Thank you for those suggestions. I also want to remind viewers in case Shannon forgot to do it, that Dr. Doreen cannot give child-specific advice because it would be a this service to your channel. So thank you for those suggestions. Thank you, DJ. DJ, you're doing a better job than I am. Are you trying to steal my job? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was a great job. Let's, it is a great job. Okay, moving on to your next question, because you have a question about a full body sock. The next question is, how can you prevent the overheating when you need a full body sock? That's a great question, DJ. You know, I don't, I don't have good ideas for that. There are lots of different, this, this is a similar problem to several other things. We, you know, sometimes kids actually feel really calm when they're in a hyperbaric chamber and they, that's because of the pressure and so on, but that's also an environment that's overheated and they feel uncomfortable because of overheating. Uh, but the only suggestion I have is that you would reduce the temperature of the room, uh, perhaps have fans around or just uh, increase the air conditioning when the child is using the, the full body sock. But this is a common problem and I think people who make these body socks should consider making mesh ones or ones that are made of like a, a stretchable types of cotton mix rather than full nylon polyester. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, now your next question, DJ, I think is a brilliant question. I can't wait to hear the answer to this as well. You ready? My next question is what is the difference between the what is the difference between traditional ABA and the Denver model of ABA a little dirty for the US leading expert in this field. Okay. We That's, hear this a lot, people talking about the Denver model. Sure. The Denver model is extremely different. So let's just start with that. The Denver model is, uh, so I'm trying to shorten my response here. Okay. The Denver model support, says that it is a uh, behavioral and developmentally appropriate model. It's a model that's been ba that's based on developmental milestones, for instance. It doesn't have the very specific subcategories that ABA has, and it doesn't have the specific protocols that ABA has. So, for instance, under the, the category, the overall name of ABA, we have like different types of ABA. For instance, we have uh, pivotal response, discrete trial, natural environment, these are all types of ABA. We also have uh, protocols uh, such as, and I'm sorry I keep doing this, but my earphone keeps dropping out and I want to be able to make sure I listen to DJ. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we have different protocols which are things like shaping, chaining, these are specific techniques, right? Uh, Denver model is not based, doesn't incorporate those protocols at all, doesn't incorporate those subtypes at all. 
it is more and I my knowledge of the Denver model let's be sure let's be clear is nowhere near my my knowledge of ABA so um, I have read the Denver model manual completely and I've had a presentation on it by um, Lori Vismara who was very well versed in the Denver model but it is more of a program that interacts helps interaction with the family member let's say or teaches the child it's much more similar to an NET type model because it is much more loosely structured than a than a strict ABA basic program ABA don't forget has generally you know that you may have you may share some of the general ideas for instance behaviors increase when you reinforce if you ignore a behavior it'll go down both have those types of ideas in mind but ABA follows a very strict type of process like for instance when you're doing discrete trial you have you generally will uh, provide you know a an SD or an instruction you'll give the child a specific time frame to respond then you reinforce in a specific schedule of reinforcement there's a predetermined amount of time in between trials you want to make sure the child is successful at least every third trial so there's 30 percent none of that exists in the Denver model it's more of a, a much more natural general type of teaching and it does um, have a lot to do with social interaction it teaches much uh, it focuses on social interaction with the caregiver so it's a it's a very very different model and I know that recently the Denver model has been kind of uh, has received a lot of coverage for insurance coverage and funding uh, coverage but uh, I do want to reiterate it is an absolute and, and they do to some extent try to say that it is an ABA type thing I don't consider it an ABA type uh, program at all good to know yeah now DJ we're running low on time so I think we only have time for one more question uh, so question number four go ahead my next question is what are some disorders or syndromes that are related to or have Co you to yeah, DJ, you asked the best questions, let me tell you. This is one that I'm really kind of passionate about because I feel that there's a lot of other stuff with, with individuals with autism. There's a lot of comorbidity. Um, the top one I would pick is anxiety. For me, I think there's a lot of anxiety in our in individuals who have um, autism and other disabilities as well because just uh, functioning in the real world is hard for those individuals and so it's, it's actually with autism in particular you have a lot of sensory uh, sensitivity and I think that leads to a lot of anxiety for our kids so I see that as being the number one comorbidity that exists um, there's other things too for instance there's a lot of sleep disorders that are comorbid with autism uh, you know, medically, there's a, a large portion of our kids have gastrointestinal inflammation, which is comorbid. Um, some of our adolescents and, um, let's say, higher functioning individuals with Asperger's tend to also have some depression. So um, I would say those are, pro and of course, I used to say, you know, of course, now it's its own classification. So I should say the number one thing they have in common is obsessive compulsive disorder. Obsessive compulsive disorder used to be classified under anxiety and now it has its own entire chapter in the DSM-5. Um, I still feel that the self-stimulatory behaviors, the ritualistic parts of autism are pretty much synonymous with obsessive compulsive behavior and so that would be really the highest correlation I see. Okay, really quick Shannon if you wouldn't mind this there is the news a ton. My last question is hopefully you have a poor answer for it. Is what do you think about giving medical marijuana to autistic children? You know, I love the fact that you persisted and threw even in, though I said through in your time. first question, <laughs> I admire that in you, DJ. That's great. So, um, you know, I, I, this is how I feel about everything, DJ. I'm very open to things. I'm not a, a judgmental person at all. I can't judge people when I haven't st uh, stood in their shoes. My personal feeling in regards to uh, medical marijuana, 
my personal feeling is that it, it, it has too many detrimental factors associated with it in regards to chronic use and that it will over time, uh, it's, it, the benefits are not enough. The, the detrimental part of it outweighs the benefits. Having said that, I mean, I just feel that it will slow down brain processing, it reduces learning capability, it affects memory in a bad way. There's a lot of things like that. Having said that, though, I have seen children and adults who are so unbelievably, un, um, I guess I don't want to say unhappy, but uh, almost tortured in, in the environment because of the overstimulation. They're, uh, hyperactive, they're running around, they're, you know, self-injurious, um, parents can't handle them, they're just irritated. That's the word I was looking for. The environment can irritate someone so significantly that sometimes the, uh, really something that is calming will help them. So I absolutely will not blame a parent for um, using medical marijuana in order to calm their child down. Sometimes you see children who are just hurting themselves from, from overstimulation. So that's my general feedback on it. You know, I personally wouldn't uh, recommend it, but I certainly understand. I have, never, I have not lived in the shoes of a parent who uh, deals with an aggressive or irritable or unhappy in, a child who is self-injurious and so on. DJ, that's unfortunately that's all the time we have, but you got all five questions in, and we're thrilled that you had an opportunity to be with us. Any last words to Dr. Grampuche? Uh, Dr. Doreen, I just want to thank you very much. And if you get a chance, I did send my updated PowerPoint to uh, Shannon, and I also plan to send it to Sarah. And I also wanted to thank you for getting that. Uh, ABA study to Sarah, she did uh, send it to me, so I do appreciate that. DJ, it's a pleasure, and I really, it's very meaningful for me that I met you. Thank you so much, and thank you very much for my wonderful certificate and award. It will go on my wall, and uh, God bless you. You are an amazing individual, and um, you know, just doing what you do, you're helping a lot of other people as well. Thank you so much. And I'm sure we'll be in touch still. I'm sure we will. Thank you very much. Thank you, TJ, because we only have a couple of minutes. Of course. Family wrote in and said, we just moved from Virginia to Florida. It seems that there is no special autism program for kids, so he's going to regular special education. My seven-year-old son previously was referred out of regular special education because he simply needed more resources and assistance. His IEP was seen by the Florida schools, and they said no IEP meeting was scheduled to discuss my child. They said that they have to match what is on his current IEP, but how can they if the IEP came from a special autism program? My son basically needs one-on-one -on -one support with his schoolwork and constant supervision as he has elopement issues. After reading his IEP, they asked me if someone needed to be outside to walk him back to the house when the bus drops him off. That question made me think that they didn't read his IEP at all. I don't think that's the case. And any information on transferring to a new state with another IEP would be awesome. Open houses tonight, and I want to be armed with the right questions slash demands. School starts on Monday, and thank you so much. This is good stuff. It is good stuff. Okay, so there is, and you should tell the parents about these resources as well. Basically, the general rule is that states to state, the different state has to try to come as close as possible to uh, implementing a previous, a, another state's IEP. It doesn't matter if they, don't, if they have different rules and so on and so forth, they have to come as close as possible to implementing it. Now, and I'm sure you have some other things you want to yeah. say about this, but yeah. what I want to say is, um, first of all, it's very likely that they don't really understand autism, really don't understand your child, which is probably why they don't understand that, yes, someone needs to be there to get him from the bus and so on. But uh, you need to educate them a little bit. But I, this is how I would go at this. I would actually look at this as a positive thing because my dream environment for any of our children is a regular ed in, uh, placement with a one-to-one -one full time aide or two full time aides who rotate so your child's never alone. Um, I seriously think that is the best possible environment for any child, regardless of their level of disability, because 
he will now have lots and lots of uh, 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 good models for both language and behavior around him and he'll have an aide who will know him really well and will teach him and will prompt him, model things for him, assist him, support him, reward him, everything you need to have a successful transition. Yeah, I, I, I think it's really interesting and uh, where you're at, and I did a little bit of research on Florida and Florida IEPs and how the schools handle uh, IEPs coming from out of the state. And across the board, uh, there were a lot of lawyers saying that Florida will try to, they have a responsibility to give you as close to what you had as possible. You can't, you know, when you're tr trading apples to oranges, it's going to get creative, and that's where your argument is. Argue up. So if, if you had a special program, and it, let's say that it was 10 kids to one uh, professional, and it wasn't a one on one aid, and they're putting them in a classroom with 20 kids to one person, that's where you argue for the aid. Well, I had 10 to one, you have to give me 10 to one. Argue, argue up to get things, don't give ground, because Florida will be looking to whittle down your services. They have to match as closely as they can what you have until they do an evaluation, and until they do an IEP, which they might push to happen within the first 90 days. The suggestion that I found from all the resources that I had was try to get an outside assessment so that you can be arguing what, against what their assessment finds. Correct. Um, and, and don't give ground. Show them that you mean business. That's right. Uh, and so let's talk about that for a moment, too. Yeah. And I actually happen to have had children in Florida who I treated and put in a one-to-one -one aid. Now, although you're in a state that is kind of behind when it comes to special education and so on, it is a state that's the forerunner in terms of BCBAs. Florida has the most number of ABA professionals of really? any other state. Yes, because the BCBA started in Florida. The BACB started in Florida, and it was the first state. It was actually called something else then. But are so they working in business and not in autism? Because no, why aren't there autism. more autism centers? There's a ton of autism centers okay. so, and, and universities to university programs. So what I would suggest you do is you do get an assessment from a BCBA for your, uh, as part of the IEP for the, the actual IEP that they hold. Get an assessment of, of the, have them do an experimental or even just a regular functional assessment and figure out all your needs because the more you document it, and then also please get an assessment from a psychologist. Because I think it would be important to have a pile of needs that you go to the IEP with. So as Shan was saying, you may have an IEP from the prior district, but because they can't provide the exact same thing, it's almost like you're starting from scratch, so you can throw new things in. Don't hesitate to throw new things in so that your district gets the idea that you're going to move up and not down in terms of support. You are going to, you get yeah. to the support that your child needs. And when they say, well, that's not in your IEP, you can say, yeah, but what's in my IEP as a program? Are you starting a program for me? Because you're not. Oh, okay, so then you need to... Like, you just keep on them. Yeah, and you know what, don't even, it doesn't even matter if it's in your IP or not. A behavior could have just emerged. Uh, you know, a behavior can emerge because the child doesn't have additional support. A behavior can emerge because you moved states. I mean, it doesn't yeah. matter. That, you know, those are facts. You can request an IEP at any time, even if you're in an old state. Yeah. Um, but when, the, but what I'm told is that when they do the IEP, when they do the testing themselves, they're going to argue down. You argue up. I think that them asking you the question about does he need support to get from the bus to home is a trick question about well, if he doesn't need that, then why would he need that at school? I think they're trying to catch you saying, well, no, we don't need to have that so that they can say, well, then he doesn't need to have that at school. We all need to yeah. be careful how we answer the questions they ask about what's happening at home. And I would recommend asking for more support la rather than less because you really want to set him up for success. Yep. If in the future he needs less, great, then you can always reduce it. Yep. 